Hi, it's Paul Dana. This is GreatDad.com, and I'm here in my series of podcasts talking to talking to dads, talking to expert dads, and I'm really excited to have Mike Forrester with me today. He's got his own podcast called Living Fearless Today, and he and I share a lot of things in common about our our attitude toward fatherhood. And I think this is going to be a really interesting conversation because he's what to go wrong with fatherhood and and like how to how to make sure that you're you, you know you're looking at it in the right right way so welcome mike paul i appreciate it thank you for inviting me to join you thank you for for coming it, we kind of talked a little bit beforehand and, and i i don't want to i don't want to put you in a box here but you, you said you're a self-described raging raging dad that was your yeah. that was your experience of fatherhood and then you which is part of your podcast is talking about how men can transform can you talk a little bit about how you woke up to that, that realization and how you then proceeded? Yeah. Ever so rudely, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's kind of one of those, you're just going through life and I didn't ever really feel satisfied or happy about life. I mean, mm. the whole thing was I felt in one aspect, like I was Eeyore and I was just down and life was happening to me. You know, it wasn't like, hey, we're lifting you up and you're doing great. It was like, oh, my gosh, really? There were more shoes than than I wanted in the closet and they all seemed to fall. It was every time I turned around, there was something negative happening. At least that's wow. the way I looked at it. And the side that went with it, it was married with me feeling like I was the Hulk. I was always mad. You know, the best way to put it was that walking in my house for my family was like walking on eggshells. Because I was like that time bomb. And when dad went off, it was a nuclear bomb because it was the safest place to, to let that anger, that rage come out. Was it the right thing to do? Absolutely not. But work won't take that kind of behavior. You will soon be out of a job. Yeah. And, uh, you know, so yeah, I was, I was very much the angry dad. And I thought I was the only one that was like that. And that was further, you know, couldn't be further from the uh, truth. I, I think a lot of men and a lot of women can really identify with that because your family will put up with you for a, for a good long time, even though you're, you're yelling and screaming. Whereas like you say, at work, that doesn't, that doesn't go over so well. So yeah. yeah. I mean, my son, Paul referred to me as like an authoritarian. I was very much a dictator. And so he, he was at a younger age, right? And we'll say he was probably six, seven years old at the time, knew to avoid me. I mean, that was ingrained with him. Oh, that's dad's, great. yeah, dad's mad, steer clear. And that was kind of the MO. I mean, I'm, I'm a father of, of four children. You know, now they're all adults. But at the time, I was very, you know, dictatorial, you know, iron fist, and didn't play well. Not at all with relationships. And at the same time, you, you didn't have any substance abuse problems. This was just this was just who you were as a dad during those years. Yeah, I. It wasn't something like, "Hey, I'm going to be the abusive dad that my you know my kids hate." Yeah. Paul, I had no realization of, you know, how to do it healthy. This is what I grew up with, so I repeated it. And you know, the clue should have been, "How well did this work on you?" It, yeah. It, which it didn't because, I mean, I got out of Dodge as soon as I could. My children obviously wanted to get out of Dodge, you know, because it's like, yeah, dad's mad. Let's steer clear of him. But I didn't clue into it until later. And then that was when it's like, you have a choice. So. Yeah, I'd love to dig into that a little bit about the, this, this idea of unhealthy patterns that are passed on and how those kind of manifest themselves. Because I think a lot of people you know, we imitate our parents or other role models. And sometimes we act this way just because, you know, you hear about this alcoholics, marry alcoholics, because they, they feel the most comfortable in those, those situations. It sounds like some of this came from your upbringing and what you thought was normal in the family. Yeah. You experience it. You want it to be normal. Yeah. I mean, what kid doesn't want it to be like, hey, yeah, I'm just like everybody else. Right. I don't want to be seen as, yeah, I'm the odd duck. You know, it's like I'm in an abusive home. I didn't really realize what it was at the time, but I didn't want to be the one that was the odd man out from all my friends and what they were experiencing. So my parents, you know, were the ones telling me, you're a mistake. You'll never amount to anything. 
Yeah, it, it was, it was one of those things. It's not healthy. We can all look at it from the outside. Like if you did this stuff, Paul, I could have looked at it and went, what are you doing? Yeah. But the problem was I was blind to my own actions, not seeing what I was doing and the impact because I turned right around and went about, I became a dad. I did that belittling, just demeaning, you know, hurtful kind of labeling to my kids. And so, yeah, we, we definitely repeat what we have experienced. And, you know, unless we are intentional, we make that decision to be a different man, to react differently, you know, to, to be a healthy, you know, male figure within our own house. And we're, we're just going to continue to repeat that pattern. Yeah. So I, I, I mean, I really feel like very, I'm feeling very vulnerable, vulnerable right now for my own blind spots, because like you say, you, you go through this and, and God knows everybody is, everybody's got hard jobs. Some people are doing two jobs. There's not a lot of time for a lot of introspection. And we talked a little bit about how men are even more prone to no, lack of introspection, but what, what are there recommendations? You're a, you're a coach. You work with men in transformation all the time. Are, are there any, any ways a man can look at himself as a father and try to analyze what kind of job he's doing or whether he is on the right path or if he's totally ignorant or blind to the, the wrong things. Yeah. I, I would say if I had stopped and honestly made that assessment without wanting to give a, give a reason to say, no, I'm okay. Right. I didn't want to be the failure. I didn't want to feel worthless. And so I was making excuses for myself in the process. If I was unbiased and just went, how do your kids feel about you? Mm. Huh? Let's see. They're going and talking to mom. They don't come to me. That's a flag. Yeah. So if, if we're at a point where we're honestly pursuing being healthy, you know, increasing like our own self health, right? Our, our position, then, then we can take self-reflection. If we have men around us that are open to having those con kind of conversations, fantastic. Then have a conversation without trying to stand up for yourself, you know, excusing the, the reactions and how you're behaving. If you and your wife are still at a place where you can have those con kind of conversations, then that's a great thing to do as well. And I tried doing that, Paul. I didn't come at it the right way. Yeah. So my wife and I went off on an anniversary trip and I asked her all these hard questions. Ooh, I was yeah. not prepared to receive the truth that she was giving me. Mm -hmm. And she was testing the water saying, can't, are you safe enough for me to tell you? Yeah. I wasn't, but we continued to work on it and it got better, but it was rough. <laughs> And, so, uh, so yeah. but you had, you, you had an epiphany along the way. You told me you were, you, mm -hmm. you, you were on a road to divorce and you were feeling distance from your kids. And, and I guess uh, aside from going to see a therapist or meeting a coach and having some real deep conversations about what's going on in your life and everything, how, how did you have that epiphany? I mean, you, so I grew up knowing, or sorry, being told, and the belief was founded that if you failed at something then that made you a failure. And so asking questions was a sign of weakness. And again, puts you in that place of failure. I got so tired of being the victim of being angry, not having a relationship with my wife, you know, like where it's like, Hey, I'm glad you're home. It's like, Oh, crud, what bomb's going to go off now? It, it became bad as like a reflection, if that makes sense. You know, I could, I began to feel the tension and the, you know, being dissatisfied. And so I finally got to the point where a couple of the, the guys at work and they were younger, which even impacted and made it worse because I was like, oh my gosh, I'm going to the younger guys and these guys already, you know, have it together and I'm older than them and I don't like, wow, I'm really a failure. You know, that was the thought process that was going on, but I stopped and I, I took that chance and I honestly, you know, struck up a conversation wanting to know what's different 
with you, with how you're dealing with your family, just everything in your life. And it was one of those moments where it was, I just, I got fed up, Paul, and I wanted something different. And until I stopped and did that, I would have kept going until my wife divorced me and I was without my children. But that point in time was like, oh, this isn't as bad as I thought. I, you know, I'm not a failure just because I did this. And so it put me on a different path. It wasn't easy. It was still one of those of, I don't trust you enough to really have a conversation about this because I don't want to be the odd one out. This really painted as a failure that doesn't have it together, but it was just getting to a point of exasperation. I was tired of things being the way that they were. I knew what I wanted and I wasn't there. So just getting to that point of frustration and finally breaking down to ask, what are you doing different? Yeah. I want to talk a little bit more about the, what you, what you learned about transformation and how you coach men on that transformation. But one, there's one thing I wanted to ask though, first is that you, you probably got to the realization that you, you know, you, you'd had an effect on your kids and it was not a happy home life and things were bad there. I mean, some men, you know, get divorced and then they disown the first family and, and create a second family based on what they learn. But I think I want to see if there's a message in here to dads who maybe do have the same feeling like I'm, I'm, I haven't been really great dad. And, and, you know, the kids now are 10 or 12 and, you know, can I ever repair that relationship? Or is it now just broken and I'll always be that crappy dad that I, you know, mm. think of myself as? Yes. It's never too late to start working on ourselves. And that truly is where it, it needs to begin. Because otherwise, it's like you may put a new engine in your, in your car, but if you haven't, you know, turned it on and become like fully who you are and you heal and grow, you're still pushing that car. And so the relationship as far as being a husband, as far as being a father, you're still pushing against who, like that unresolved part of you. Yeah. And so the traction and that you could make in those relationships won't be as much as it could be if you were in a, in a healthier place, if you weren't, you know, feeling that frustration, then you could fully step into it and, and engage with your wife and be able to like stand by your children. Does it mean that they're going to change overnight? And go, Dad, I fully trust you. I see the change. Right. No, it doesn't. I wish it did. That was the hardest part yeah. was building, rebuilding that trust with my children so that they would then come to me instead of running from me. But just as we were trained by our parents, they have now been trained, hey, this is how dad's going to react. And as we heal, they'll then have the opportunity to see, hey, dad doesn't react in that same way. And they can decide, you know, to engage with us differently. But until we start dealing with ourselves personally, the other stuff just, it's kind of like dominoes, right? Yeah. You and I are the first one that needs to go and the rest of it will change. Well, I think that healing, that healing metaphor is true. If you think of a, a young child, they scrape their knee and they, 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 their beak heals far faster than you know, yours or mine, he would. And I, I find my kids are a lot more forgiving than I would expect them to be, especially when I go to them and, and apologize, you know, hat in hand and just really come clean about things. So I, it was that your experience. I mean, I know it took a while, but uh, there was some, some rewards along the way in that transformation. Yeah. And it wasn't easy. I, I mean, at all, because it's like, I'm going up to my kids, Paul, and I'm saying, I'm sorry, I apologize. Whoa, that's huge, like weakness, you know, it from my perspective at that time. And so it's going against everything I had learned. Especially if you were an authoritarian because oh. you're, you're like, yes, you know, black and white kind of issues of us and really are. Paul, I was like off with their head, you know? <laughs> and wow. so I'm coming in and putting myself in a place of humility and yeah. asking for forgiveness where somebody could say, no. I don't want to forgive you at this point in time. You're vulnerable. 
but it's from that place that the trust and and the the healing can begin because if i come off cocky and like i've done nothing wrong if i offended you or if i hurt you man people can sense it paul that is not a genuine place of reconciliation i'm sorry sorry if you're feeling bad but yeah (laughs) and and there can be a time for that in you know if you've come to apologize and somebody isn't understanding things as you came at them but with our children and our wife it's usually in a different place and me coming and trying to defend my position and actions through something like that of if you know it it does not work out it doesn't carry the message it sets a different unhealthy tone where it's like i still can't trust you to be real and to you know honor and value my feelings the same way you do yourself so you know just coming to them and apologizing and genuinely saying i'm sorry you know, I'm working on this and explaining they knew what was going on. I mean, it's not like I was, you know, keeping the secret from them. They lived with me. They were running, you know, it, it, it wasn't an, a secret. It was well known, you know, we'll either speak the truth and, and put it out there, or it's one of those of, yeah, we can see the emperor's new clothes and they are not what he thinks they are. <laughs> so, yeah. Definitely. And then, and then, the dangers of not going through this introspection, whether you have kids or not, men are far more prone to to mental health issues than women. Women characteristically, they talk all the time with their with their girlfriends, and complain and get it all out of the table and cry and everything and and just and go back to back to work. Whereas men, whether they're dads or not, they, they bottle it up and then what happens? That's and that's what we're trained to do. I mean, that's the stigma of it. You don't talk about how you feel, the challenges you're facing. If you look at the statistics right now, women have a higher percentage for depression than men. It's not that we as men aren't depressed, that we don't have emotions. You know, we experience them. We're just told not to talk about them, you know, to to man up, right? The problem is we then look at the statistics for suicide. They're four times higher for men. So we stay bottled up and then we decide that, hey, there's nothing else. I can't do this right. There's no value. Nobody's going to miss me. I'm lonely, you know, because we've alienated ourselves by our behavior and our emotions. It, it is a, a path we can go down that just, I mean, that, I don't know how to say that's unhealthy any more than we can look at it and go, yeah, this is not a road you want to walk. But if we're bottling things up, it's just like, you know, toxins being put in like a 50 gallon drum. Pretty soon it's going to seep out, whether it's just over time or when we're tired, when we're angry, when we're hungry, when our, um, we're less aware or that we have less energy to fight that stuff off, it's going to come out. And we're not always in an environment where it's, you know, safe so to speak to let that stuff out and we can hurt people more than we were, would intend and ones outside of our family so if yeah. we don't deal with our stuff it's gonna come out yeah we know that there's a huge mental crisis health crisis in the united states today especially among young young girls but also young boys i don't not not more than a couple of months goes by in my community where we don't hear about about some young young man young woman committing suicide which is just a horrible tragedy and then on the other end, I think there are a lot of men who are 50 plus who, yeah. who don't, can't find meaning in those later years of life after having a career that, that gave them all a lot of, a lot of support. I'm wondering if there is some component in there too of the, of the lack of meaning as you get older, if you did not have that family thing. Cause for, for me, family is the most important thing in my life. But if, if it weren't and I got to the end of my career and then I, you know, you've always heard this, this, this. I don't know, it's an anecdotic kind of thing about the number one regret men have on their deathbed is that they didn't spend more time with their family or that they spent too much time at work. Is there anything that you see in your coaching clients that that would confirm that? Yeah, it's definitely there. I mean, 
when we understand what our value and our worth and our purpose is, yeah, we are going to, it's almost like a snowball rolling downhill. We're going to gain momentum and traction and success. Mm -hmm. And as we continue to go, then the confidence, the courage, like we take on bigger stuff. If we don't have that, it's a trailing thing. You feel that lack when the kids go through that empty nest, you know, they move out. Yeah. It, there is nothing to silence the noise of feeling insignificant and purposeless. And so that stuff will just come like a tsunami and overwhelm you. So understanding those components early on in our life is beneficial, not only as we're, you know, raising our family and, you know, going through that time frame, but also once our children move out, then we still have that purpose rolling forward. I've seen a lot of men that if, you know, friends, clients, and otherwise that the kids move out, it's an empty nest and the husband and wife have nothing to talk about. They haven't been in relationship with one another. They don't know their own purpose, much less the other's purpose. You know, if, if I understand what my wife is made to do, I can support her. But if she doesn't know it, then I can't. And if she, if I don't know mine, she can't support me. So it just kind of creates like this silent, unspoken rift that then it's like empty nest, divorce, and other things that just don't go yeah, do you know in a positive to direction. Think about that, Pat. That's the, yeah. So what, in your coaching practice, do you, do you have a process for the trans, kind of transformation that you went through? Do, how do you, how do you, how do you develop the, how do you, bring men through this transformation? Yeah. So it is one looking to determine like what your purpose is. What are your values? Like, am I going to go rob a bank or am I going to help somebody across the street? You know, what are you going to do with your time and your energy? There's only so much. We all, you know, have this bank account of time that we can draw from and we can either spend it, you know, in a, in a way that doesn't, help our purpose or we can send it, you know, spend it in one that does it, that elevates and builds it. So understanding your values, your purpose, looking at your mindset, right? What beliefs do you have? Paul, I had all kinds of beliefs, you know, you know, I didn't have worth. I was a mistake. Those things dictated what level of risk, what decisions I made, whether it was conscious or unconscious, moot point, doesn't matter. It's still driving. So whether you're consciously having a, sh a chauffeur to drive your car of life or, or, you know, whether you're, you're, you know, knowing where you're going, it's just kind of one of those, you need to understand what are your beliefs? What are you holding on to and why? And then also being grateful. Having come from, you know, being Eeyore, where I felt like life was against me. Man, that, that was a journey in and of itself, Paul, where it was, what am I grateful for? I'm grateful for the fact I have my wife, that I have my children, that we're working on improving our relationships, right? Even stuff that went wrong. Okay, what can I learn from this? And being grateful for the lesson, not necessarily the situation. It's like, yeah, I really wanted to be laid off. Nope. But. It gave me the opportunity to find something that was a better fit for my skills, you know, that, that fit my, my dream, my vision for later in life that was better aligned for it. Mm -hmm. So helping somebody to go through those, to, to see where you're at now different and understand what are the dreams because you're gonna work hard. I mean, you're changing. How many, how many people have ever gone through change? And it's been simple. I mean, we don't just wake up and it's like, Hey, things are different. You're going to put in some reps. You're going to put in some time. You want to be able to be consistent and make that change and know why you're doing it. And so that kind of stuff just strengthens you and helps you to push further and farther, but then also celebrating because I think too often we make these changes and it just day in, day out, day in, day out, we don't see the transformation. You know, hey, I would have blown up when the kids did this. Yes, I did. But 
I then apologized and it was genuine and I did it within this time frame, you know, be it hours or days, it was shorter than before. Cool. Because that kind of celebration, that acknowledgement and recognition will be fuel to continue us in, you know, in our growth. It's going to help us to continue to push for, for changing even more and getting to where we want to be. Yeah. So those are some of the components that it's like, I just want to get through like the next hour today, even, right. You know, when, when it feels like it's all against you, sometimes you only have energy for the next hour and it's like, okay, how am I going to make it? This is the kind of stuff you reflect on and you go, okay, yeah, I've got more in me than I believe I do. Yeah. And those, those things help you to, to stay on target and get back on target when you get off. This is what I really love about coaching versus therapy, not to take anything away from therapy. There are times when people are in holes where they need to, they need to, they need to relive trauma and, and deal with that trauma so that they can get to a hole. But what you're talking about is really setting up an intentional plan with an objective in mind and not, not just working on your past, but more focusing, working on your future. So that future is better. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the one thing, like Paul, this, this will sound probably you've probably heard it a ton of times. I thought that when I started healing, that I was going to lay out my path that it would never deviate. You know, yeah, it, good point. It, it was, it was set in stone. Yeah. Oh my gosh. It, as I went down that path and began understanding, you know, limiting beliefs and the things that had gone on that had left, you know, those beliefs in me that were false, it was like, oh, and then that would turn a key. And then another one, I threw out, I don't know Matt, how many hundreds, probably thousands of dollars of like steak and chicken, all kinds of frozen food, Paul, because, <laughs> because growing up, my mom and dad put a lock and a chain around the fridge and I couldn't ever get in it without their permission. Fast forward to where I'm a father and a husband, I can buy my own freezer. I can fill it with food. At the time, Paul, if there was food in the freezer, I felt secure. I felt like a man. Now, I don't know about you, but I do not want to grill a five-year-old steak that's freezer burned. It is not going to be tasty in any way, shape, or form. But that belief was there that yeah. set an emotion in place. And it wasn't until I recognized this is really not healthy. Yeah. This is not true. Yeah. That I was able to address it differently and go, okay, that doesn't have a hold on me anymore. Yeah. I, it's just, I wish everybody could do this, this work. I mean, it's such a gift to yourself to, to do this kind of thinking with somebody else who's, who's focused really on you for an hour of a time. Yeah. yeah. I think that the thing is we have to individually get to a point where we're willing to see things and do the work to bring about the change. Because Paul, you could have come to me and said, Mike, this is what's wrong. I was so pig headed yeah. that it was like, whatever, Paul, you're wrong. And I would have ignored you and blown you off and may have just terminated the friendship. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's not until we personally get to that point that we can bring about the change that we want to see through the work that, you know, we can now identify, this is who I want to be. This is what I've experienced. How do I now make these changes to get there? Because, I mean, I can set out and go, I'm going to take a vacation, but I don't want to go to Chicago. I don't want to go to LA, but I'm going to head out on the road. Paul, I may get to Yuma and be like, hey, this isn't where I want to be. Whereas if I had started out knowing where I want to be, let's say, you know, Miami, Orange Beach, Alabama, you know, wherever, if I start out with that intentionality and set that direction, then I can get there rather than going, this is not how I want to be identified. This is not where I want to go. We need to know who we want to be and how we want to go about it and continue to discover it and give ourselves the space to, to expand and change that plan as we go forward. Yeah. Yeah. I'm so glad you you shared so much of your own, your own struggle with this because, you know, my, my website is called greatdad.com and I don't pretend to be a great dad. And I, 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 it's more of an aspiration, which men can have versus women. Women never do a great mom.com, but, but dads can aspire to that. 
openly. But I, I, I failed a million times, learned along the way. And I think it's just such a great message to, you know, to younger dads that uh, you will fail. Maybe hopefully you're not going to fail as large, big as you did, but you'll, uh, no. you will fail along the way. And then you can, you know, you can do the introspection and, and be better. Like we all, we're human beings and we're, you know, we're all trying to get better. Yeah, absolutely. It is never too late. You know, we may in our head go, my kids are adults. It's too late. I don't know about you, but I wanted that relationship with my dad. If he had ever been reciprocal in it, which I tried numerous times, it was not something that he was willing to venture into. So, you know, it's like, you'll never know if your children will forgive and extend the hand unless you try. And if you don't try, that regret is there regardless. So it's never too late. You're worth taking the risk. You're worth the investment. You won't see the return unless you start today to make that change in your life. Yeah. Okay. Well, it sounds like a good time to wrap up, Mike. I, I, there's really been a very interesting half hour and you, you, we've gone over a lot of things that I've thought about, but it added then measurably to my thinking about this intentionality and, and helping, helping young dads. So you're, you can find my Forrester at high Mike high coach Mike.com, which is where you have your coaching services. And then you have a, you have a podcast living fearless today, which I've got to put on my, in my queue as well to continue learning with you, Mike. Well, I appreciate it, my friend. Yeah. It's never too late and there's always somebody on that journey. So give yourself grace and keep pushing forward. Thank you for having me on here, Paul. I appreciate our conversation. Thank you, Mike. Okay. So on all days at greatdad.com, you can find my coaching services at greatdad.com slash coaching. And until next time, take care.